Bible and find it, 1 John. These, this letter, 1 John, is called 1 John because you also have 2 John and 3 John. This is from the Apostle John, so the one that uh, it says in John's Gospel, which he also wrote, is the one that Jesus loved, and uh, he was one of the inner kind of three within Jesus' friendships, you could say. He had his, you know, many, like over 70, 100 probably to followers, then he had his 12 apostles, and then he had sort of these three, the Peter, James, and John. James and John were brothers, and they saw and heard things that others didn't, like the Mount of Transfiguration, which we looked at earlier a few months ago in, in the Gospel of Luke. Wait, m- way more than a few months ago, a while ago, uh, when he took them up, right, and they saw the transfigured, glorified Jesus. And anyways, this is who that is. So, when we look into this passage today, you can kind of have an idea. Here's a, here's a man who had walked with Jesus from, like, basically the inception of Jesus's public ministry. Uh, he was there in the boat when, you know, Peter was hauling in too many fish, and he couldn't do it, so he calls James and John, the other fishermen in the Lake of, the Sea of Galilee, come help us, and then James and John were part of the crew, and they followed Jesus around. They were his disciples. They were his disciples. They followed him. So, um, I'll, I'll explain why we're in First John in a second here, but let me just remind us um, about discipleship. This is a, a phrase that we brought up back in January. It's a phrase that's been ringing in Richard's head, Ken's head, my head, hopefully your heads, um, because I, I really don't see uh, this sort of a dichotomy between being a Christian and being a disciple. I just, I don't see those two as being two options. I just see them as one kind of like church and Christian. There's no such thing as church apart from Christian. It's, if you're a Christian, you're a brick in the church, like you're part of it. So, there's no, there's no dichotomy in scripture. If you're a Christian, if you have given your life to Jesus, you are a disciple, and that has massive implications on your life. So, what is a disciple? A disciple, at least in the first century, which is where we see the word used in, in scripture, a disciple was one who would look at, in, this is so, I'm, I pretend I'm a Jew, okay, um, I would look at the various uh, fa- uh, Pharisees and rabbis and all the teachers of the law, and I would pick one, and I would pick one to be the one that I followed, and I would become that rabbi's disciple, right? So, even like someone like John uh, the Baptist, he was this, you know, prophet, he had his own disciples, he had his own followers. They'd, so, basically, there's three things that would um, make up a disciple. They were a student of whoever that was that they were they were following, so they listened to them, they took notes, they, they learned, okay, so they were a student, they were a follower, so if that rabbi got up from, let's say, Jerusalem, and they went up to the Sea of Galilee, or they went this way or that way, you'd follow them, right, you would, you'd follow them, and that makes sense, because remember, when, when Jesus, who is this rabbi, you could say, tells James and John, follow me, they let go of their nets, they said, see you later to Zebedee, their dad, and they walked with Jesus, because It's about following your rabbi. So the followership is a huge aspect of discipleship. And the last thing, which sometimes is is forgotten, but it is essential, is that to be a disciple also means to imitate your rabbi, to imitate them. So you're not just a a fan. You're not just kind of following and being like a groupie, right? I've talked about this before. You're not just a groupie where like, I'm just going to go where Jesus goes and just, just keep, you know, whatever. It's actually beginning to think as Jesus thought, to imitate his thoughts, to say what Jesus says, to imitate his words, to do what Jesus did, imitate his actions and his deeds, right? A disciple is not above his master, but when he is fully trained, he is like his his master. So, there is this imitation reality of discipleship as well. And discipleship is your life of following Jesus, learning from Jesus, and imitating Jesus. To disciple someone is to help someone else in their discipleship, So, that word discipleship and discipling, it can all get convoluted, but if you think of it merely as discipleship, this is my life and journey of following Jesus, learning from Jesus, and imitating Jesus. And as many of you know, it is hard. It's hard. You know, some people uh, might say, oh, no, it's easy, and whatever. People have different capacities. I'm just going to say it's hard because Jesus says it's hard. So, if, I don't know, whose word you want to take. Someone says it's easy or Jesus' word. I'll take Jesus' word. It can be hard, and it's difficult. Uh, Discipleship is hard. In fact, Luke chapter 14, which should have been where we would be today, really emphasizes some of the difficult aspects of discipleship. So, here's the reason why I didn't go into Luke 14. Not because I don't want to 
teach on hard things. I do, um, because it's important, right? But I just felt this week that before we jump into Luke 14, which has some difficult concepts of discipleship, I felt like we needed to come and just sort of be, kind of soak and marinate in the love of God. Because if we just kind of jump to these really hard texts without a reminder of the great and gracious love of God, then it, it could be just kind of damaging. We could be thinking about it in the wrong kind of way. So just a heads up, like Luke 14 coming up, uh, it, it's going to be, you know, tackling things like family, which is one of the top priorities in many North American people's lives. Like family is so essential. And oftentimes we put family even above Jesus. But Jesus says, no, no, no cannot put family before me. Notice that I didn't say don't put church ministry over family. There's a difference between church ministry and Jesus. And Jesus makes it very clear that we as disciples must put him over our family, which is like, it's like, really? Um, so we have to kind of dig into that. We're going to dig into that next week. But he also gets into things like security, your finances, your business, all these things that take up so much time. Family, business, these things are probably the things that take up the most mental energy and heart energy in our lives today. And Jesus says, put those all aside. Not that they're not important, they are, but I come first. So we're going to look at that uh, next week. But before we read that, I want us to understand the love of God, and that's what this week is going to be. Love must be foundational to our discipleship. It has to be. It, it must be. If we have this idea that Jesus, God, the Spirit is just this taskmaster, this tyrant that we just have to bow to and just do whatever he says, because if we don't, he's going to smite us. If we have this kind of view that he's this hard master, that's going to influence our lives in a, I would say, a very destructive way. And I just want to remind us of the compassion, the love, and the grace of God that ought to constantly be flowing in through um, us. And I want us to particularly <laughs> look at lo God's love for us. So this is a great study before we hit Luke 14. So we're going to be in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 13. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 13. And, and basically, in this little section here, in these few verses, the Apostle John makes, gives a command, okay? And this is, remember, this is inspired by the Holy Spirit, meaning everything that John says is being inspired by the Spirit. So these are the Spirit's words to us. And the command is, love one another. This is what you must do. You go and you love. And obviously, much of 1 John, if you have read it, emphasizes the, the importance and the necessity of loving others. Okay, basically, John says, you could sum up 1 John and like, if you don't love your brother, you don't know God. That's kind of 1 John, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's the importance of loving others. So it would make sense that in this little passage within the, the heart of the letter, John's telling us, love each other. But he doesn't just say love each other without any reasons. He gives reasons. And he actually, in this passage, gives three reasons why we ought to love one another. And it's these reasons that emphasize God's love for us. And I want us to really see these and um, see the radical reality of the love of God that we get to experience today. All these reasons we get to experience today. So I'm going to go through each of these reasons as we go through the text. We'll apply them as we go. And I'll just say, because I, I need to give credit where credit is due, uh, John Stott and I are preaching this together. He's not here. He's in heaven. But uh, he has a great little comment. He was an uh, English commentator, pastor, theologian in England and uh, in the 20th century. And he, uh, he's just a great, great writer, and he helps things just make a lot of sense. So he has a little commentary on this book, First John, and it, it helped a lot as we go. So he'll be, uh, we'll be take teaming this, okay? So the question, why are we to love one another? That's the question, because that's what he's t telling us to do, which we'll see why, John, why should we love one another? Three reasons. Reason number one, because real love, and I say real love because I'm not just talking about love of the world, I'm talking about real, true love. Real love is rooted in God himself. It's rooted in God himself. Let's look at verses seven and eight. <clears throat> this is what John writes to the Christians in the first century. Beloved, let us love one another. So there's the command, right? we got to love one another. For, so here's the reason, love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8, anyone who does not love, and that like references the loving God, loving other people, anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. 
Lots of love, lots of God in those two little verses. Let's unpack this together. Firstly, God is love. What a profound, almost simple, but yet so profound statement. God is love. We see that again repeated in verse 16. And not only is God love, but we read in verse 7 there, the love is from God. If God is love, then any, he will protrude love. Love comes from him. Therefore, if that's who God is, and if that's what comes from God, it would only make sense that his children, those that are born from him, um, and those that who know him, they would ine- inevitably love others. It just comes from that. In the same way that my daughter Emerald and Adoniram and Primrose, they all have characteristics that mirror and reflect Brittany and I. If God is a God of love, then those that are born of him that know him will love. It's just, that's what happens. Adoniram's going to look like me. In fact, there's a picture that my dad put up of Adoniram and me at the same age. We look exactly the same. And um, it's, there's going to be these similarities, these inevitable uh, things that come uh, across, okay? So there's a strong connection between God and love, and therefore anyone that's born of God will love. But what is love? And we have to ask that question because we all have presuppositions on what love is. Growing up, you're, the way that you were nurtured or not really nurtured in your home life, that's going to give you a big understanding of what love is. Those, those, the, the culture that kind of you were babysat by growing up, whether it was the screen or this or that, that's going to teach you uh, many things about what love is. Your relationships growing up, I know some of you are older, but your relationships growing up, maybe you had different girlfriends, boyfriends, and then maybe different marriages even for some of us. Like, that's going to teach us of what love is. Like, we have all these sort of a history of all this baggage of what love means doesn't mean. And now we're in a, a season two where there's all this cultural confusion on, on, you know, sexuality and love is being kind of screamed from the rooftops. But I think it's important that people ask, what are you talking about when we're talking about love? Love, love, love. What is love? love. So we must see what God love is in distinction of what world love is. And I want us to look mostly at John's letter because that's enough for a solid biblical understanding. So if you just go back, you don't, you might not have to turn your page, go back to 1 John 3, okay, chapter 3. And I want us to look in verses 11 through 18. I'm just going to read through this and comment as we go. So I'll first read 11 and 13, okay? Verse, this is chapter 3, 1 John, verses 11 13, through 13. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. There it is again. It's all throughout the letter. Love, right? Verse 12, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Okay, I'm going to stop there. 11 and 13. Okay, so Cain and Abel. If you don't know who Cain and Abel are, these were the two brothers, sons that came from Adam and Eve. Cain was a hunter. Abel was, you know, working in the ground in the farmer, okay? And they both gave an offering to God. God accepted and received Abel's first fruits, uh, and Cain uh, did not, God did not receive Cain's offering. Cain got angry. He took his brother out in the backfield and killed him, okay? So that's the story of Cain and Abel. And what we see here, what John is doing is he's helping us see that loving another, loving others, is so opposed to murdering another. And I hope I don't need to say that, right? I think you know the distinction, right? Murdering someone and loving someone, those are two distinct things. And the murder, as we see, is a result of Cain's evil deeds, which is totally contrasted with his brother's righteous deeds. It's all good. It's a little emerald. He's good. Uh, the murder was a result of his evil deeds contrasted with his brother's righteous deeds. So I just want you to see here that what John makes here, John makes this connection between righteous deeds and loving others and evil deeds and murdering others, right? So why did he murder him? You can see that uh, right there in verse uh, 13. Why did he murder him? Because, I'm, I'm lost here for a second. Um, sorry, in verse 12. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So you can see the strong connection between righteousness and unrighteousness with murder and with love. Okay, let's go to verses 13 and 15. We're just helping understand what love is here. Let's go to verses 13 and 15. 13 says, Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Whoa. And you know that no murderer 
has eternal life abiding in him. So we're just making these connections here. Listen, love corresponds with eternal life, and that is diametrically opposed to death. We can see that so clearly in verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life. Why? Because we love. Love is connected with life. Whoever does not love remains and abides in death. So do you see that connection there? Love, life, right? And hate, death. We can see this sort of, this, this, here's a dichotomy if you want one. Love, life, light, death, evil, darkness. This is dichotomy, a dichotomy that uh, John makes very clearly. John Stott writes, a lack of love is evidence of spiritual death. And he also says love is the evidence of life. So we can see this strong connection here. Therefore, as we think about how that then relates to God being love, it's essential for God to be love, right? He can't not be love. Since love is the opposite of darkness, hatred, and death, unless you want to say that God is a God of death and hatred and darkness, which I hope you would not say, God is a God of love because he can't not be. Love has to do with righteousness and eternal life. God must be love. But still, what is love's essence? We know that it's the opposite of hatred and death and murder and darkness, but what is its intrinsic nature? Right? Is it this feeling of like just looking at someone and be like, ooh, butterflies? Like, what is it? What is its intrinsic nature? Verses 16 through 18 tells us, so straightforward. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. He, Jesus, laid down his life for us. By this we know love. Like, he's not making it any clearer. You want to know what love is? Here, I'll I'll tell you what the the nature, the essence of what love is. He laid down his life for us. We're going to get into that more in a a moment, but just listen to what John Stott writes here. He says, the essence of love is self-sacrifice. That is the essence, the core, the nature of love is this sacrifice for another. Another commentator writes that love is the willingness to surrender that which has value for our own life to enrich the life of another. Are you starting to see this? Love is the giving of oneself for another's benefit. And it could be very costly, right? In verse 17, we saw that it could be goods, possessions. You have the world's goods. You give those to others. That could be costly, like giving things away, your time, your energy, your possessions. But it could even be as ultimate as our life. The sacrifice of our own life for the benefit and the enrichment and the help of another. John 15, 8, 13, very famous verse, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life, right, for his friends. So love is not a feeling, essentially. Feelings are obviously wrapped up in love, yes, but the essential core and nature of love is not feeling, but it is truth and work, deeds. Let us not love, John says, in talk and sentiment and all these nice, warm fuzzies. Let's love in real practical reality that's what he is getting at here and this now makes sense when we read jesus saying love your enemies when was the last time you had warm fuzzies for your enemies you're like oh i just get so excited with my enemies i don't want to just i love them like none of you none of you do that that's weird right none of us you sick in the head if you think that way it's just strange but if we understand biblical love as the giving of oneself for the benefit of the other. Ah, now I can love my enemies. I can love my enemies. So I don't want to make this divorce between love and feeling, because obviously feelings are all over the place. God is a God of feeling. He grieves. He loves. He's indignant. There's all these realities of feelings in God and emotions. Emotions are a gift of God. Dr. Richard, he knows a lot about emotions. Um, Sorry, (laughs) he's laughing. Um, (laughs) No, I just, feelings are good. Emotions are good. And a lot of times when, like, let's say with my, my wife is not my enemy, so when I love her, there's a, a harmony of joy in it, right? And Jesus tells us it is more blessed to give than to receive. So, when, so that's so connected to love, because if love is by its nature a giving of oneself, well, that means that there's a blessing involved into it as well. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So there's so many, there's so many feelings that are wrapped up in love, and that is good. So I don't want to 
denotes feelings at all. Okay, so, but what about this whole God is love? It's different to say that God loves, but God is love. How does that make any sense? Well, love is God's eternal nature. In and of himself, even before he created the heavens and the earth, he is love. Was love, is love, will be love forever. It's part of who he is. He is essentially a self-giving spirit for the benefit of others. Just always giving of himself. Now, the question we have to ask is that, okay, if he is love and was love before even you and I were created, who are the others that are being benefited from his giving of himself before we were created? That's a good question. I don't know if you followed that, but basically before there was just, when there was just him from eternity past, right? Psalm 90, before the valleys and the mountains came forth, he just, he, from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. In the everlasting past, eternity past, how is he love if love must have two parties involved because it's the giving of oneself for the benefit of the other? How does that work? Well, that's where we see the profound reality of the Trinity. God being one essence, one being, and yet in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of John, in multiple places, we read that the Father loves the Son. God the Father loves His Son. So when we read that now with the understanding of what love is, the Father from eternity past, has given of himself for the benefit of his son. He's exalted his son. He's honored his son. He's helped his son. He's loved God the son from eternity past. We even read Jesus saying, you father, this is in his John 17, in his heavenly prayer. He says, you father loved me, Jesus, you loved me before the foundation of the world. There was this love and intimacy and and giving of oneself even before the foundations of the world even happen. That's in John 17, verse 24. But we also read the opposite. So it's not just the Father loving the Son. We read in, let's say, John 14, 31, I, Jesus, love the Father. So from eternity past to eternity future, the Jesus, the Jesus, Jesus is going to be and is still and will always be giving of himself for the glory, the honor, the power, everything of the Father. He's giving of himself for the Father. All right, so that's the Father and the Son, but what about the Spirit? Well, This is what we read about the Spirit in terms of love. Romans 5, 5. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The very love of God is poured into us through the work of the Holy Spirit himself. So you can see the Holy Spirit is one of love. In fact, in Romans 15, 13, it says the love of the Spirit. There is a love that comes in and of the Spirit. In fact, the first fruit, the first work, the first evidence and proof of the tree of the Spirit is love. Galatians 5, 22. So God's spirit is one of love, one of giving oneself for the benefit of another. This existed from eternity past, even within God himself. So with this being the case, it makes sense that those who love, like you and I, are those who are of him, if he is God, right? We are those that are born of God. Not only are we born of him, but we know him right? How could we truly love if we don't know God who is love and who gives love? And the opposite is true, as John says, anyone who doesn't love doesn't actually know God. So we ought to love because real love is rooted in God himself, the God that we worship, the God that we follow, the God that came to us in the person of God, the Son, Jesus Christ, who we follow in our discipleship, is a God who is intrinsically, essentially love from eternity past to eternity forward, not a tyrant, not this mean, hard master. He is love. That's good news, that he's by grace going to be giving of himself for the benefit of of others all the time. Even within himself, he does it. So this reality of the love of God, the giving of self for the benefit of the other, no matter how great that sacrifice could cost you, now leads us to the next reason for why we ought to love one another. So number two, why do we love one another, church? Because God's love has ultimately been demonstrated in an act of God. And in this act is where so much of the power comes. So Let's read verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest, displayed, revealed among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation, atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
Okay, let's look at these two verses, because this is, this is amazing, okay? Verse 9, this is the demonstration of God's love. That's why he says, uh, in this the love of God was revealed, manifested, displayed. So here's the demonstration of God's love. I'm going to rephrase it just so it's very clear. The love of God was, so notice it's in the past, because love is not essentially a feeling, it is essentially acts, works. So the love of God was displayed in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through that son. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. God sent, not God felt, God sent. It's a deed, it's a work. God sent his only son into the world. Who is the son? What is the world that he sent his son into? As we read, God's son is his only son, his only begotten son. This is the unique son of God. All of us are sons of God, only because we are in that one unique Son of God, which is Jesus Christ. The same word in, I guess, the Septuagint, uh, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is the same word that Abraham uses for his only son, Isaac, that he's called to go sacrifice in Genesis 22 on Mount Moriah, right? This is my only son, the son that the promises were to go through, which they did go through. Same word. This is the unique Son of God. God. Jesus is unique, uniquely God's Son. Jesus is the very self-revelation of God given to the earth. I love that. And multiple places in the New Testament, and I've, I've, these kind of verses I hit on all the time because they're so good, like Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God. If you want to see what God's like, the Father, you look at Jesus. Or Hebrews 1.3, he's the exact imprint, of the, uh, radiation of the glory of God, right? Radiation. He radiates the glory of God, okay? Uh, John 14.9, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You get this reality. He is the self-reflection, the, self, the, 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 the revealed self of the Father is in Jesus Christ. And because he's the exact imprint of God who's perfect, he is perfect and without sin, as 1 John 3, 5 says. He's totally sinless, totally perfect, the only Son of God. And He is what the Father gave to the world, sent into the world. John Stott says, No greater gift of God is conceivable because no greater gift was possible. God gave the world that which is, was, always will be His own, His only one and only Son, who is in fact God the Son. And I just want to remind us too that this Son that He sent is the Son that He's loved from before eternity, right? Always, from eternity, everlasting, everlasting. There's this love between the Father and the Son. That's the Son. What's this world that the Father sent His Son into? Well, in one kind of sense, it's creation, it's earth, right? which is good before the fall and still has good aspects. We still see the heavens declare the glory of God. They're still good, but the curse of sin and the curse of the fall has marred it, including us as well. When John talks about the cosmos, this world, it's sort of the world system, you could say, affected by sin, ruled under the evil one of Satan. So listen, this is very important. Whether directly or indirectly, in this letter, John, the Apostle John, writes about this world, and he writes about this world that God sent his only son into, and he says that this world is one where darkness, lies, deception, stumbling, sin, shame, lawlessness, murder, hatred, death, condemnation, error, fear, punishment, and idolatry exist. That's the world. That's the cosmos, the world system ruled by the evil one. On top of this, as I just said twice, in chapter 5, verse 19 of 1 John, John says the whole world lives in the power of the evil one, the devil. Okay, And not only this, even more on this, many antichrists have come in the world. Antichrist, it's not hard to understand what that means. They oppose Jesus. They oppose Christ. They oppose the Son of God. And not only this, but the icing on the cake is that this world is passing away, as 1 John chapter 2 says says. Therefore, put this together now, God sent His only beloved, perfect Son 
into the dark, lying, deceitful, sin-filled, shameful, lawless, murderous, hateful, dying, condemning, error-ridden, fearful, punishing, and idolatrous world that is ruled with power from the devil himself, is filled with many who directly oppose his son, which is they are anti-son of God, and it's passing away. So we can read it just like, oh, God sent his son to the world, oh, no big deal. When we recognize what this world is, who it is that's ruling this world, who is in this world, we come to see the sacrifice that the Father has given. This is the Son that He loves, His own Son, who He's now given and placed in this dark, dark world. Would you willingly send your kids into that? I was thinking about that. I was like, I don't know if I would ever send my son into a place like that. A place where there's many anti adonirams <laughs> I don't want to send my son into a place where everyone's opposed to my son. And yet, Romans 8.29 tells us, God did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. But why? We have to ask. Why? Why would God, who has loved his son for eternity past, why would he send his only beloved and begotten son into such a horrendous place? Well, as verse 9 says, so that we might live through him. Remember what love is? The giving of oneself for the benefit of the other, so that we might live through him. The we here means you and me, everyone. What's the implication here? Well, without God sending his son into the world, we would remain in death. We would die. Everything negative that applies to the world applies to the world because we make up the world. I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. We're that reason. And more specific, our sin, which is the root of all evil and unbelief, it's what the enemy deceived Eve and Adam into doing, Back in Genesis 3, it condemns us. Our sin condemns us and causes us to face the wrath and the punishment of God, which is eternal death. And more than this, our sin proves that we are of the devil. In 1 John 3, 7, it says that. If you look at verse 7, it says, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. These are hard words to hear, but they're true. Our sin even proves that we are of the devil. 1 John 3, uh, 14. We know that we have passed through death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. This means, we've already read that, but this means that without the God of love doing something in us, we remain and abide in death with no hope. And 1 John 5.12, I'll also read that one. 1 John 5.12 says, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Because the Son is life, is love, is light, we remain in death until we have Him. Right? Until we have the Son. And by grace, God sent His Son. The Word of life, eternal life, the light of the world, He sent into this dark place. Without Him, we have no hope, no life, just death. But with the Son, if we have the Son, as that verse says, we have life. So without Him, though, hopeless, right? But God sent His Son so that we might live through Him. Let that sit. We don't even know the details at this point. Just know that, man, God has given up His Son, given us His Son, so that we who are dead, in death, in the darkness, might live, might actually live, eternally live through Him. So the love of God was displayed in this way. God sent his only son into the horror of this world so that we might live through him. Somehow, we <clears throat> can be rescued because of this Jesus, this son of God that was sent by God the Father into the world. Now, verse 10 gives us the meat of what verse 9 is getting at. Let's read verse 10 together. This is in chapter 4. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So now we're going back to the essence of love. The demonstration to the essence of love, but in way more specific detail. Here's the rephrase. Love is this. And we're not talking about our love for God or our love for others. We're talking about God's love in its purity. Love is this. God sent his son. The implication here is the world. Okay, God sent his son to the world to be the propitiation for our sins. So love is this, okay? God sent his son to the world. Love is an action, remember? 
to be the propitiation for our sins. This is the purpose that corresponds to the purpose given in verse 9, that he was sent so that we might live through him. So the, him being the propitiation for our sins is the reason for our life in him. So how does that work? First, that we have to understand what is our sin. Before we look at this weird P word that we never say, what is our sin? 1 John 3 verse 4 tells us straight, lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. John Stott, remember we're tag teaming, he says it is a defiant violation of God's moral law. It is an active rebellion against God's known will, which you and I from birth have just followed it. Defiantly disobeyed, decided like Eve that we can decide for ourselves what is right, what is wrong, because we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We can decide what's good. We can decide what's evil. We can live our own lives on our own thrones. That is sin. It is lawlessness. It is an act of rebellion against God's known will. And this is a result of the deception of the devil, that ancient serpent who ruled this world. Sin is our willful refusing to live with and by God so that we might live with and according to ourselves and not God. One way to emphasize the seriousness of sin is to realize that Jesus, as John the Apostle writes in 1 John 3 and 4 and verse 8, he appeared, Jesus appeared in order to take away sins and to destroy the works of the devil. If the main purpose of Jesus, God sending Jesus, was to take away sins, to destroy the works of the devil, that tells us a lot about the seriousness of sin and the seriousness of the one who deceived us into sin. If Jesus' main goal was not just to come and give us rainbows and lollipops, but was come to destroy the devil and to wipe away sin, that tells us something about the seriousness of sin. To, to sum up, Without cleansing, without an atonement, only death is the reward of sin. But he came to be the propitiation for our sins. So what is this P word, okay? The propitiation is that thing which bears the wrath and punishment for the sins or the evil of someone else. Okay, this is why it's essentially sacrificial. Someone steps in and substitutes themselves for someone else. It's love. Propitiation is love. I mean, it can't be anything else. It's what it is. It is total love. The Son of God, Jesus, is that propitiation, that sacrifice that God gave for us, for our sins, so that we might live through Him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that ought to be such a motivator for us to go to the ends of the world to share about the life that people can have in Jesus. You see, our sins, church, condemned us to punishment, but God sent Jesus to be the punishment taker for us. And not only do we get forgiveness in this, but we get so much more. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3 tells us that Jesus is our redemption, yes, but also our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification. But the emphasis here is on this reality of him redeeming us by his blood. John loves to emphasize how Jesus shed his blood as that propitiatory sacrifice for us in our place, he died to save us. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen? 1 John 2, 2, he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. 1 John 3, 5, he appeared in order to take away sins. 1 John 3, 16, yes, John 3, 16 is good, but also 1 John 3, 16, he laid down his life for us. 1 John 4, 14, the father sent his son to be the savior of the world. Propitiation is the key to life. Without Jesus' sacrifice, church, there would be no forgiveness of our sins, which means there's no regeneration in our hearts, which means we remain in death and murder and darkness and hatred. The love of God is ultimately demonstrated by the act of God sending His Son to this world to be the punishment-bearing sacrifice for our sins so that we might have eternal life with Him. And this is grace. This is absolute grace because none of us, and I'll be the first to say, do not deserve that kind of life. No wonder Paul calls this grace from Jesus an indescribable gift in 2 Corinthians 9.15. Now, I throw, away, I throw out that adjective indescribable all the time, but when you actually think of it, indescribable, Jesus and what he did is indescribable. This gift of Jesus, it can't even be described. That's why in my description of it, it's still kind of like going over some of your heads. You're like, oh, I don't really get it. Because it's kind of indescribable. It is so powerful and magnificent that it just causes us just to get on our knees and say, God, I don't even really get it. But all I know is that it is indescribable and it is amazing and it is all of grace and I owe everything to you because of this life that I live through your son, Jesus. Okay, that's the second reason. The third reason why we ought to love one another. 
Here we go. The love of God now flows through us. This is a reason why we ought to love one another, because God's love, his very true love, is now flowing through us. Verses 11 through 13, back to chapter 4. Beloved, if God so loved us, there's the emphasis again of the greatness of his love. He so loved us. Verse 9 and 10 prove that. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but, ESV doesn't have but, but I like, if you have the NIV, the but's in there and it's good. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Here's the last reason why we ought to love one another, okay? No one has ever seen God, and you can't see God. God said that to Moses. Yes, I know you want to see me, but if you see me, you die, because God is so holy, great, magnificent. He dwells in unapproachable light, as Paul says to Timothy, but thankfully, he's shown us himself through Jesus, right? He's shown himself through Jesus, but there's more here. The NIV, like I said, includes this but, and it's, I think it's in there for better understanding. This is what the, how the NIV uh, interprets or explains this verse, or sorry, translates no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. So listen to what John Stott says here. The unseen God, you and I cannot see him with our eyeballs, okay? The unseen God who once revealed himself in, this, in his son now reveals himself in his people if and when they love one another. God's love is seen in their love because their love is his love imparted to them by his spirit, as verse 13 says. You following here? By loving one another as spirit-empowered people saved by grace, by loving one another as spirit-empowered people, we experience the actual love of God. It flows through us. So that great propitiatory love of God that is the ultimate demonstration and essence of true love, when that affects us in our hearts, that love now spreads and continues on in our lives. This is why Jesus can say, they will know that you are my followers when you love one another. Because by loving one another, you actually are experiencing and giving others the experience of the bona fide love of God. That's amazing. That's so good. And yet there's even more. His love is made complete in us. Listen, in our love for one another, not only are we seeing God's love and experiencing it, but we're seeing God's love being finished, completed. That almost sounds blasphemous to think that, right? That we are completing God's love by our love for one another. But I think Stott helps us see this. He puts it this way. God's love for us is perfected only when it is reproduced in us or, as it may mean, among us in the Christian fellowship. And I get this. Let's pretend that I'm really wise. I'm not, but let's pretend. Brittany's the wise one in our family. Uh, Let's pretend that I'm super, super wise, okay? And when my kids are growing up, I'm imparting my wisdom to them. I'm like, I'm helping them. I'm giving them good advice. I'm teaching them about biology and whatever, blah, blah, blah. All this stuff of wisdom. Well, if they turn 20 and they just go and totally reject my wisdom completely, there would be something unfinished in my wisdom. And yet, if they go on and start to live out that wisdom and impart that wisdom to others, then my wisdom is made complete. It's kind of like uh, how John says at the beginning of this letter that he's proclaiming Jesus so that his joy may be complete. There's something missing until someone experiences the same joy and then passes that joy on to others. That's when joy is complete. God's love is made perfect in us when we take the love of his, his perfect love and now extend it to others. God's love is made complete when we get to extend it to others. So here's my conclusion. These three reasons are what John gives so that we might be compelled to love one another. And of course, I mean, that's John's intent in writing what he's writing, that we love one another, and that's, that is our application, so please do that. But I really want us just to be met once again with God's love as specifically laid out in the reality that God is love, that the God we serve, the God that we follow, in following Jesus as his disciple, we're following the true God, In following him, we have to recognize that he is the God of love from eternity past to eternity future. It's his very essence that he is a God of love, that we don't need to go to him in fear 
I've talked about this with a brother in this room that we shouldn't have to go to God with this guilt-ridden, just feeling so guilt. Like, no, like he is the God of love. He's so ready by grace to give of himself for your benefit. We can go to him. This is the God that we follow. He, real love is rooted in him. But not only this, he has made himself loud and clear 2,000 years ago that he loves us. And that's the demonstration of his son. He gave that which was most important to him, his very self, his very son, for the benefit of others. That's huge. Many of you here are parents. And just the thought, the thought of giving up one of your children to death for the benefit of someone who hates you is just hard to even fathom. And yet this is what God did. He demonstrated that self-giving love by grace to us. The love of God now flows through us, and that's amazing. So let me ask, what better God is there? Seriously, what better? I mean, seriously, bring Allah to the table and and Brahmin and bring all these other people and the humanistic teachers. Let's bring them to the table and let's ask a question. Who is the better God here? Who is it? Can you say that about any other God, that God is a God of love? God is love? Is Allah love? I don't know. Here's a God whose greatest act period, is once and for all the self-sacrifice for the benefit of those who don't deserve it. Is there a better God there? Did Buddha lay down his life for you? Here's a God who lets us experience his real true love as we love one another. He's given that which is his own intrinsic nature to us to use and to bless others with. Is there another God who would lend such a gift to unworthy people? God's love is so essential for our discipleship. So as we come to Luke chapter 14 next week, we have to sit in that reality. God is a God of love, and he loves us so much that he would give his own son Jesus to give us true life. And now we get to take that same love and extend it to others all over the world. So we are going to participate in the Lord's Supper.